Arcanum 11 is a profound study and inner exploration of how the force of love and the cultivation of a serene mind are deeply connected. This tarot card depicts a woman closing the jaws of a lion. But who is she, and what does she and the lion symbolize? How do the principles depicted as symbols of this arcanum connect our inner and external universe? To discover the answers to these questions, we must begin by learning about the difference between coercion and persuasion. Coercion begins within us, often in a very subtle way, unfolding from the inner dimensions of our mind and emotions. Imagine a child who encounters a pit bull that, for whatever reason, is barking with immense force. If such an impression of life enters the child's multidimensional body of thought, emotion, and physical senses in an unconscious way, without inner observation or inner awareness from the child's consciousness, that creates or feeds a fearful ego, which is a mechanical I or me in the psyche of the child that says, I am afraid of pit bulls. Pit bulls are scary. Years go by, and this child grows into a man with this ego in his psyche that fears dogs, especially pit bulls. One day, walking in the park, the man encounters a woman with a kind and sweet pit bull on a leash. His mechanical ego, who fears pit bulls, emerges from his internal worlds of emotion and thought. If the man never practiced meditation, if he never cultivated the ability to observe his inner worlds from moment to moment, the fearful I, the ego from so many years ago, will act beyond his perception, moving in the darkness of his unconscious emotional and mental worlds. These worlds, these inner worlds, which exist in both the macrocosmic and microcosmic fifth dimension, are beyond linear space and time. And thus, for this man, because he lacks the light of insight, in what seems like an instant, his egoic eye of fear causes a mechanical reaction. That fear has coerced the man from within, dethroning his conscious willpower and possessing the man's body, his vehicle. Immediately, the fear directs his multidimensional body, and the man is trapped by anxiety, worries, acting fearfully towards the woman's pit bull. Thus, that fear now feeds itself in a mechanical way, and his body language and his words are expressions of that fearful ego, because that is what's in control. Like most people on this planet, we can imagine the woman has her own internal legion of egos. The woman absorbs this impression of the man's fear into her own inner dimension of emotions and thoughts. An ego of pride, perhaps, within her reacts in its own mechanical way. That eye of pride emerges in her heart and mind, and it says, I love pit bulls, and I hate anyone who thinks they're dangerous. Like the man, she is unable to consciously observe this because it's in her unconscious darkness of those inner worlds. Or she might be slightly aware, yet unable to simply observe this ego, resulting in her own mechanical reaction. Instead of observing their inner worlds in a state of neutral serenity, the two interact, but in a mechanical way, through their egos with egos now commanding each person in thought, emotion, and physicality, the two legions manifest a mechanical, chaotic argument. Without even really knowing how it happened, the man and the woman are engaged in an external war of words, each set of egos, each legion, attempting to forcefully coerce the other person 
in the fifth dimension of thoughts and emotions. It's also possible to imagine how, in other cases involving extreme philosophies, ideologies, this could escalate beyond a war of words into a war of actions. In esoteric Christianity, egos are symbolized as demons who suffer and cause and create suffering. Within the inner world of thought, emotion, and vitality, any person with egoic elements is symbolically a demon. However, such a demon who practices constant observation, comprehension, and gradual dissolution of their egoic elements into liberated consciousness is on the path of repentance. Otherwise, to continue with egos, to align with our inner de demons, our inner lower desires, is to remain in darkness and unconscious forms of suffering. Now, to be clear, repentance does not mean to mechanically follow some codified doctrine out of fear or pride or some other ego, some other mechanical I or me. Repentance means that when the many forms of our divinity shows us a path out of suffering through practices like meditation, transmutation, ego death, and we directly experience the benefits to our mind, our heart, our body, we continue because we know by experience, by real faith, that it is far better than the suffering of our egos, our demons. This points us to real persuasion, which is very different from coercion. Persuasion is exemplified by any angel, any Buddha or soul guided purely by their divine spirit. An angel will offer an example to a person who suffers with egos and egoic habits and they will respect that person's will to think as they like, to decide as they like. Many people today experience the help of angels or Buddhas as lucid dreams full of symbols and symbolic scenarios. And if we are dissolving our egos, working on our egos to comprehend them, then with our own level of objective consciousness, clear seeing through the dissolution of those egos, we can more directly interact with divinity, with angels, Buddhas, divine beings, gods, goddesses, through astral projection experiences. To persuade is a conscious act of true love. It is to help without any expectation of a specific reward or result. If you reflect on this kind of love, you'll realize it is the love of a mother. To be specific, it is the love of our own inner Divine Mother, who is the woman that serenely closes the jaws of this furious lion on Arcanum 11. In fact, to place our conscious awareness towards our Divine Mother with all of our heart and meditation practice is one of the highest forms of prayer. If you seek to comprehend something, whether it is our most pertinent egos to dissolve or a symbol within any arcanum or esoteric teaching, your Divine Mother will always help if you are patient, diligent, and humble in the request, especially through your heart. This is a highly recommended way to take any teaching or example in this video or any other video on this channel or any esoteric teaching and then comprehend it beyond mere intellectual analysis. To understand the meaning of numbers we receive in lucid dreams or astral projection, we use Kabbalistic addition until the number originally received or given is 22 or below. We can also use this form of esoteric mathematics to study and meditate on the profound connections between the 22 major arcana. With Arcanum 11, for instance, 1 plus 1 equals 2. The Divine Mother, the receptive force, wisdom of all the cosmos. 
God the Mother multiplies into many aspects, from the very space that holds all of the cosmos, to our individual Divine Mother, who birthed our soul and consciousness, our inner cosmos. Two is the number of duality, expressed to an infinite degree with Arcanum 11, the most multiplicative number. A few archetypal examples of how unity unfolds into infinite duality are concepts like positive and negative, active and passive, Osiris and Isis, Shiva and Parvati, husband and wife, father and mother, sun and moon, fire and water, heat and cold. Over the course of multiple lifetimes as a humanoid, we learn from angels and demons, suras and asuras, the being and egos. When we are ready, we discover teachings like the ones in this series on Tarot and Kabbalah. And our being, our spirit, God within, begins to reach out to teach us. The Hebrew letter Kaf is the first letter in Keter, which means itself the crown. Keter is the highest sephiroth or sphere in the tree of life, Kabbalah in the Hebrew tradition. However, on this tarot card, we find the letter Kaf in the realm of physicality and action known as Asiya pointing us to reflect on how this symbol relates with our life here in the physical world. Kaf itself can mean palm or sole of the foot. As dream symbols, generally speaking, hands relate to how we act mentally, emotionally, but especially physically. The feet relate with walking our life's path, and in Kabbalah, the feet are also related with Malkuth, the physical dimension, and can also relate to our sexual energy. With any dream symbol, understanding what that symbol means in our dream requires meditation, so our intuition can spontaneously interpret the context of the dream and the symbol and the scenario. The more intellect is following intuition in dream interpretations, the better. For instance, in relation to Arcanum 11 and our egos, the Hebrew letter Kaf can relate to the Gnostic teachings of Jesus, who famously lived out a crucifixion featuring a crown of thorns on the head and the heart, but also the piercing of the torso, the hands, and the feet. You might be wondering how this relates with what we've studied so far in Tarot and Kabbalah. Kaf and the profound esoteric teachings of Jesus, who embodied the cosmic Christ, the universal Christic force, points in part to how we must learn to crucify each of our egos, to die to each mechanical me, myself, or dream persona within our body of psychology that causes our dreaming at night and our unconscious dreaming during the day. If you practice inner observation through daily meditation, which is to observe thoughts, emotions, and impulses as they arise and fade away through your awareness of those inner worlds, and you also practice keeping a dream journal to lucid dream, you will begin gradually to perceive that most of the people that you interact with in dreams are your egos, taking on tangible forms in the higher dimensions of the inner worlds where we dream. And if you do practice inner observation through daily meditation, then eventually in your lucid dreams, you may begin to examine the people you encounter more closely. You might examine their appearance, their way of speaking, their actions. This is a result of as above, so below. 
because you are waking up in the physical dimension, you are waking up in the higher dimensions, the inner dimensions. To dissolve these dream people, our egos, and ultimately die to each one is to crucify an ego, a dream person. Such a feat requires a powerful ability to observe our inner worlds moment to moment with serenity. The key is that we must know how to be with an ego, to be the observer of the ego and the observed ego with all its lower desires or aversions, suffering while denying the will of that ego that we are embodied through observation. If we slip into an ego, we suffer. If we stay with conscious observation, the serenity of the Christ, we triumph. This is why Jesus depicted ego death in such a profound way through the piercing of the hands, feet, and solar plexus and crown. Of course, this is the height of dying to egos. And because we are at the beginning of our practice, most of us, we require much help from many other aspects of our being of divinity, represented by the symbol of Aries. In each of us, certain egos are easily comprehended, causing little to no resistance. Other egos, however, contain far more fire and will put up great resistance against comprehension and ego death. These titanic egos will fight like it is a war to end all wars. This becomes most intense when man and woman, each polarized with the creative force of the cosmos, bind those forces in alchemy, or when a single person transmutes even to a lesser degree internally because our vital fire is a cosmic force of creation whether those creations are of heaven or hell, conscious or unconscious, the being or ego. Thus, an internal war is always the result when a person seeks to self-realize their inner divinity, to meditate, transmute, and to dissolve their egos. This is part of why persuasion, Arcanum 11, relates profoundly with Ares, the Greek god of war. Aries, like any aspect of divinity, is a cosmic intelligence within each being, including each of us. Aries, the Greek expression of this cosmic intelligence, can help us in the internal art of spiritual warfare. This cosmic intelligence is represented in many cultures and mystery traditions, such as the Roman Mars and the Christian Archangel Samael. You could even relate it with the Norse Thor. All these archetypes exist within, and we can meditate on them, holding them in our memory while intending for their guidance, their assistance, asking with humility, with the heart, it is interesting, when considering what we just discussed about Kof and the egos and crucifixion, to reflect on the figure of Thor. Thor uses a hammer of the gods, the Norse symbol of the cross, or alchemy and transmutation, and also a symbol of willpower. Thor's hammer also commands or conducts lightning and thunder, made of water, air, and fire, which is the cosmic electrical power of Divine Mother Kundalini, the Holy Spirit found in our vitality, Yasad, our sexual energy. Also, the name Thor reminds us of Thorn and the crown of thorns, as well as the hammer, the willpower that must pierce the hands, the feet of our egos through will, with serenity. The willpower to die to oneself, to the me, to the I, ego. That esoteric death requires a willing, conscious reunion with our inner divine fire. Externally, this fire takes on the physical form of any star, including the sun of our solar system, represented with this alchemical symbol. The sun is the very same Egyptian Ra, the Hindu Rama, and the Christian symbol of a lamb, which grows into a ram. 
to invigorate and awaken our consciousness, we must learn how to work with the solar fire. Of course, we also have the solar fire in our solar plexus, making the Ooh mantra very effective. Another profoundly powerful and practical way to begin working with solar energy and fill our microcosmos with light is the powerful mantra Aum, A-U-M. You can perform this mantra in meditation, imagining the pure light of the spiritual sun or solar fire entering through your head. If you find the visualization causes too much intellectual chatter, then instead focus on observing the inner energy, the inner vibrations that will gradually build up by repeating the mantra. To chant or sing this mantra, start by fully opening the mouth in a relaxed way and vocalizing the A, A, then slowly close the mouth so that gradually the U or U, as it's pronounced, will vibrate its note with a gentle rounding of the lips. You're not making an O shape so much as the O mantra, so it's more of a Ooh, or ooh. Continue to slowly close the mouth until the lips close and gently press together and vibrate the holy note of M. So, ah. Repeat as many times as feels comfortable but I would recommend at least begin with nine rounds. You'll notice that with practice, the movements of the mouth become more natural and you can focus attention on the internal vibratory resonance within your body, within your inner worlds. Eventually, with regular practice of this mantra, you will also notice a very pleasant energy helping to relax the body, mind, and the heart. As taught by Samael on Veor, this mantra, Aum, is a terribly divine and creative mantra because it attracts the forces of the Beloved Father, the Son, and the Wise Holy Spirit. This is Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, each with their wife, who is the Divine Mother, with multiple, infinite forms. The A attracts the forces of the Father, the U, U, attracts the forces of the Son, and the M, M, attracts the forces of the Holy Spirit. So when we sing or chant Aum, the cosmic trinity of supreme creative forces is descending, vitalizing, guiding, and healing us, all to help us comprehend concepts far beyond what our intellect or even emotions are capable of processing on their own. So really practice it if you haven't. On the uppermost portion of Arcanum 11, in the dimension of living universal archetypes known as Atziluth in the Hebrew tradition, we find a downwards facing triangle. This triangle is a symbol with many meanings. Atziluth the realm of archetypes is the origin of every culture's god or goddess, and it's the divine principle in every culture of time and space. Even tarot and Kabbalah in the Hebrew tradition is merely one such archetypal expression of divinity. And like those expressions, it's abstract. The so Atsiluth is also related with our head. Uh, our pineal gland and crown chakra, and the first trinity. This is why the Aum mantra can provide us with healing and instant knowing, intuitive knowing, because it summons those cosmic forces down through our mental, emotional, vital, and physical bodies. And in fact, this triangle does indeed point down towards those lower bodies. With its three points, the symbol reminds us of our three brains of intellect, emotion, and motor instinctive vitality. 
This touches on a deeper meaning of this triangle, which symbolizes the Divine Feminine, the formless electrical Divine Mother's energy, or Divine Mother herself, it's the same thing. It's she who can create, can give birth to any form. A physical embodiment of this reality can be seen in the shape of the female creative sexual organ. After developing a deeper inner observation moment to moment, especially with mantras like Aum or the seven chakra mantras, you can experience through that observation how the physical body, whether polarized in three dimensionality as female or male, operates as a receptive vessel for energy and thus is fundamentally feminine in nature. We can further explore this concept by reflecting on the symbol of a cup seen to the left of the downwards facing triangle. A cup is made of earth related with our physical body and the cup itself is a symbol of the brain. Any cup is designed to hold liquid, water, in one form or another. Our brain is meant to hold the transmuted waters of our vital energy, which resides in a crude form in our sexual glands and must be heated through air, the breath, and fire, conscious willpower. In the archetypes of alchemy, they represent earth and water with similar triangles to this one seen in Atsiluth. While we, as the human personality, are learning how to work with the earth of our body, air of our breath, water of our vitality, and fire of our conscious willpower, the aspect of our being who makes transmutation itself possible is our individual Divine Mother. She, the cosmic feminine intelligence who birthed our soul, knows precisely how to transmute our inner waters from a crude state of physical matter into a higher state of energy, like cosmic electrical steam, that she can raise up our spine, our Kabbalah, our tree of life, Yggdrasil in the Norse tradition, and into the highest dimensions of our microcosmos, our inner trinity, where the supreme cosmic intelligence of our particular being can guide that energy throughout esoteric channels of our multidimensional body, ultimately distilling a conscious force of love, ecstasy, in our central point, the heart. This is why Arcanum 11 and its central figure is an example of persuasion given by our Divine Mother who we see closing the jaws of a lion. It's interesting, in ancient Atlantis, lions were said to be tame, and they were used in public teachings, sacred ceremonies held at large venues, meant to teach these uh, esoteric sciences. The lions were used to pull golden chariots, now, esoterically speaking, this is a symbol of a person with solar bodies of physical, vital, emotional, mental, uh, and higher dimensions, which are tangible bodies able to consciously live in those higher dimensions of the cosmos. When someone is transmuting their sexual energy while sitting in meditation, they are extracting the gold of the spirit from their inner waters, so that with time and effort, when they meditate, or at any moment of any day, of any time, they sit on a throne of gold, a golden chariot, whose power is the inner lion, the universal Christic fire. The lion can also symbolize higher cosmic law, the law of the gods and goddesses. However, the lion can also symbolize fire because one such law relates to how our fire can go downwards and outwards, or be consciously transmuted, tamed, upwards and inwards. Most of us consider lust as a physical activity related with the orgasm, but 
As we transmute, we realize that lust is also in our hearts and minds. As our moment-to-moment -moment observation of our inner worlds improves, we notice mechanical and morbid thoughts, images, and emotions within our hearts and minds. These are egos, and they have always been there in our darkness, our unconsciousness. And they are like a ferocious lion whose jaws are open, threatening to consume our consciousness. So as we begin to transmute and meditate, because we are raising this electrical steam, this light, we are seeing the chaos of our internal worlds for the first time. And if we become fearful, ashamed, or angry, if we lose our serenity of inner observation and become trapped or ensnared in a mechanical reactionary ego, a furious lion, then the jaws of the lion will consume us, will make us unconscious. That is a cosmic law. If our light of consciousness is consumed by a raging ego, a furious lion, we become trapped in the darkness of unconscious behaviors again, of unconscious thinking and feeling. To close the jaws of the lion, of cosmic law, and to steal back the light of divine consciousness, of awakened consciousness from within any ego, we need the help of a superior force. And that force is our Divine Mother, who is crowned with the sign of the infinite, displaying her infinite unconditional love, which is consciousness, constant, conscious, serene awareness, observation. Because of this, she's also infinite wisdom and an infinite ability to create or destroy, which may seem antithetical to the intellect, but life and death are simply two sides of the same coin, two sides of the same infinite. Through the example of our Divine Mother, of conscious love, persuasion, and by praying to her in a relaxed inner meditation practice daily, which can include mantras and subtle breathing exercises, we will learn how to better observe our inner worlds with consciousness and awareness and to look into the eyes of our egos, our angry lions with serenity, as she does. This takes infinite patience because often, especially when we are beginning this effort, this spiritual, this inner spiritual work, our mind and heart will be very messy, very noisy, full of chaos. It may cause us to become temporarily consumed by egos of shame, fear, other me mechanical reactions. And this just gets in the way of our inner growth. And this is why Arcanum 11 depicts the Divine Mother as looking directly into the lion's eyes with infinite patience, infinite love. If we work to develop our connection with our Divine Mother, whose temple is the heart, we can experience tremendous inner growth. This means we make a daily effort to cultivate our ability to serenely observe our inner worlds of body, but especially mind and most importantly, the heart. With time, with patience, we will directly experience many aspects of both our being and our egos we will first directly experience these inner qualities in our physical life, usually, moment to moment. But eventually, when the flower of our efforts blossoms, when our being knows we are ready, we will experience our being and our egos in lucid dreams and in astral projection experiences. These direct experiences, these forms of personal gnosis, can be so powerful that we find ourselves craving deeper meditation practices. Such exercises are the milk of wisdom, the nourishment of our Divine Mother, and that is why she is depicted in both Arcanum 11 and Arcanum 2 with a bare chest, because she will feed and nurture us, her child. 
as a side note, if we observe egos in us after a mystical experience, such as a lucid dream, astral projection, uh, an ego such as fear or spiritual lust for more experiences, then we especially need more meditation, deeper meditation effort to cultivate serenity, inner observation, and comprehension of whatever egoic elements have been stirred up by such experiences. That's, that's a big part of the homework. <laughs> Sometimes we may feel stuck in certain egos, especially in what I just mentioned, uh, aware of having them yet without full comprehension, without profound understanding. This is the process of an ego melting by the crushing force of love, because until we have full comprehension of any ego, we are that ego. To observe that we have an ego moving in us that is mechanical, reactionary, means we are awakening consciousness, becoming less conditioned, but we're still the ego, and thus we are experiencing the inner alchemy of persuasion, which is conscious love. And sometimes it can be painful, but it can also be blissful when we finally learn how to let go and just observe with conscious love. And whenever you do feel trapped or stuck within certain egos or with any form of spiritual practice like transmutation, lucid dreaming, astral projection, whatever it might be, heed the transcendental axiom of Arcanum 11 which states, Joyful in hope, suffered in tribulation, be thou constant in thy prayer. Pray with humility, dedication, and every ounce of your heart and conscious soul to your Divine Mother, and she will help. She will feed you the milk of wisdom. She will help transmute that inner lion from a raging beast of lower desires into an inner state of serene conscious awareness and a higher divine desire to continue inner observation inner transformation and awakening the consciousness now how we walk the path of life is symbolized on arcanum 11 in yetzera the realm of formation, where the waters of vital energy fuel our physical, emotional, and mental worlds. This bird, symbol of the Holy Spirit and our Divine Mother, seeks to guide a snake-like creature who can symbolize us in our effort to become conscious of and to refine our sexual energy represented by the perfect cubic stone. When we come to these esoteric teachings of regenerating our inner life, our spirit, we are like a snake that once crawled on its belly, but through the practices of transmutation, the snake regrows, but its legs long since forgotten. Symbolically, the four legs of the snake-like creature remind us of Makut, Yasad, Had, and Netzach, our physical body, body of vital energy, body of emotions, and body of thought, each with their own mind, their own way of functioning. The one who helps us in every moment is our Divine Mother. She helps us transmute our energy. She protects us. She teaches us. Remember, only our Divine Mother can raise the serpentine power of Kundalini up our spinal column based on the merits of our heart. In the beginning, it can be challenging to hear the guidance of divinity from within. It can be challenging to discern between the being and our egos. Arcanum 11 teaches us that our best bet when in doubt, when in any ego, is to pray for the guidance and protection of our Divine Mother and these four legs can also represent how we need to learn how to work with our inner four elements of earth, water, air, and fire. These are depicted in esoteric writings as the gnomes, mermaids, sylphs, and salamanders. 
and we can ask our Divine Mother to help us learn how to work with them as well. Whether we seek to have an astral projection experience, lucid dream, or to comprehend and dissolve any ego, we really need to understand that it is our inner divinity that makes it possible. The word sin is a term from archery that means to either miss the mark or to mean to miss the gold. And so the, the ego is what sins. It is what misses the mark, the gold. But our being and its many aspects, especially our Divine Mother, is divine perfection, omniscient, unconditional, conscious love. If we use ego to aim at ego, we will miss the mark. But aim at an ego while in the full presence, while in the full remembering of the being, with relaxed, serene inner observation, and that arrow will always hit the mark, even if it has to fly around a corner and down into a cavern to chase a fleeing ego. So whether learning from esoteric Christianity, alchemy, Buddhism, the Tao, etc., the regeneration of our inner spirit is a matter of learning the science of consciously working with sexual energy, which requires we learn how to relax, enter into stillness with each of our lower dimensional bodies, each of our four legs, and serenely observe with conscious awareness a much deeper and divine aspect of what we are, which is our being. Through that conscious awareness of our being, we are learning how to direct the fire of our sexual energy, the vital fire, and heal parts of our body, parts of our being, such as our pineal gland. This gland is related with Neptune, who is the planet and cosmic intelligence that governs the many schools of regeneration. The chakra mantra E, letter I, can help with this a great deal, as can the mantra uh, AUM, AUM. But really, the most important part of any mantra is that serene, constant inner observation. Relaxed, serene inner observation. Healing our pineal gland will improve our perception, our inner observation, our remembering of our being, and just overall inner awareness. So these are wonderful areas to practice, to strengthen our fundamental ability to walk our spiritual path moment by moment. We have a lot of energy that wants to pull us into unconscious habits and behaviors, into lower desires, habits, egos, forms of suffering. If we forget ourselves, our being, and we give into the coercive will of our lower desires, even if they have been diminishing. Our egos can also be reborn or regenerated like a phoenix, and then we have to work again to dissolve them. Although if we are lucky and we consciously make such a mistake, we can gain a lot of deeper comprehension. Better to make a conscious mistake, better to make a mistake consciously if we're going to make a mistake than to make one unconsciously because then we don't have any data, any intel on the hidden enemy of the ego. And really this too is a symbol of Arcanum 11 and it's infinite duality in a way. Right? Most of us are regenerating egos our whole life and only through our being and our Divine Mother can we begin to instead regenerate our spirit, our consciousness and our connection with all of our inner aspects of divinity to ultimately create a cosmos within us.